Nolt, uh, artificial intelligent friend or foe? So um, I'm going to introduce uh, Phil and Chris uh, from uh, Bull Creek Data and the Enfield Group. Um, super smart and probably secret guys. So we're going to see how much they can divulge um, in this session. It should be um, pretty interesting. So please have a seat, and I'm going to turn it over to Phil and Chris uh, for the keynote. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. He's got a microphone. So I am Phil Batista. You probably see me running around. Uh, initially, my business partner, Greg Morrison, was scheduled to make this presentation. Uh, he's unable to make it. His wife pulled him from the airport, and he has COVID. He is at home. I do not have his deck. This is a deck that Chris and I came up with within the past couple of hours, but it's very critical information. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris uh, Humphreys over here. All right, can you, all right, cool. So my name is Chris Humphreys. I like to open up with saying I am not an engineer. Never have been, never will be. Um, I'll, I'm a product of being in the right place at the right time. And those of you that attended my session yesterday on the national level cybersecurity exercise well, hopefully walked away with kind of how I got where I got, but the broad scope that your skill set and education can afford you that you might not have thought of before. Um, so. I am not a, I'm not an engineer. I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, but you'll see as we go kind of, I, I say my niche that I figured out after 20 years of kind of seeing disparate, you know, non-relatable career jumps I've made is that my skill is being able to speak at a third grade level without making anybody feel stupid. And that's extremely valuable. And I encourage you engineers to hone that skill. Thanks, Chris. So a couple of uh, slides of introduction here, just so you know who we are. Uh, but first, we're going to do something fun. Let's see if we can do this. Oh, let me turn the sound up. Hang on a second. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, so this, what I'm going to show you is a recording. Some of you that have uh, been to the Rising Stars before have seen some of the videos that I've uh, produced for speakers as a teaser or as kind of a trailer as far as an intro to what they're going to talk about. So this is a video that I did with Greg Morrison. He was in San Diego, home of White Tip Sharks, and I was in Austin, Texas. Uh, so th what you're going to see is the initial video that we did, and I'm going like to play it for you here in a second. I'm obviously not the person you'll Hi, see in that video. this is Phil Batista, IEEE senior member, and my guest today is Mr. Greg Morrison, chief AI officer of White Tip Sharks and a keynote speaker at the IEEE Rising Stars Conference for 2024. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, Phil. It's an honor to be part of the Rising Star lineup this year, and I'm looking forward to meeting everyone at the conference. Absolutely. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Greg is the Chief Automation Architect at White Tip Sharks. It's an intelligent automation company based in San Diego, California. Greg will be sharing some valuable insights for harmonizing artificial intelligence, or AI, and human intelligence in the enterprise. Greg has an impressive background in delivering innovative business solutions at scale to the technology market. His innovation portfolio spans both leading technology providers and Fortune 500 companies. He's also played a key role in the development of the Information Technology Infrastructure Library, or ITIL framework, and as a contributing author, it continues to be the de facto standard for IT best practices worldwide. Great, what pulled you into the world of artificial intelligence? Great question, Phil. And I think, I, Phil, I think you would agree that AI is poised to be one of the defining technologies of the 21st century, and it's gonna fundamentally change the way we work and do business. I don't think there's anyone that would argue that AI will play an instrumental role in the way we attract, acquire, and service our customers in the future. Therefore, establishing that AI foundation that's extensible and secure, you know, should be viewed as a critical success factor as you move into here. Um, but what pulled me into the world of AI? I love helping customers achieve competitive advantage with AI technologies. It's just so much fun. Um, for many customers, AI is a new addition to their intelligent automation toolkit. So we at, at uh, White Tip have uh, created a portfolio of services designed to help businesses exceed expectations, and perform at unprecedented levels. 
I don't think there's any argument that AI is poised to bring tremendous business value. But adoption in the enterprise level seems to be slower than I would have expected. Do you agree with the statement? And if so, what are your thoughts as to why? Yeah, great observation, Phil. I do agree, and there's often a number of factors that slow the adoption down with technology automation. So, and this is why it's so important to conduct that AI readiness evaluation on the front end of your AI journey, or as soon as you can once you get started, um, to make sure you can avoid rework, um, the creation of technical debt, and costly mistakes that come along with uh, possibly selecting the wrong use case or technology to deliver that use case. Absolutely. Well, Greg, I consider you to be a thought leader in a wide range of technologies. What gets you excited about AI and what can we expect to learn in your keynote at the Rising Stars conference in January? Yeah, thanks for the kind words, Phil. And there's a lot to be excited about when it comes to, to AI. Um, the opportunities are really endless. And what makes our session at Rising Stars particularly interesting is that we're going to examine that symbiotic relationship between AI and human intelligence to uncover the world where machines and people work in concert. We're going to make the session fun. We're going to learn a lot about the way IT will adopt AI as they start to move down that journey. Wow. It sounds like it's very informational and a lot of great information is going to be presented. So we're looking forward to your presentation as a keynote speaker at the Rising Stars Conference. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. I'll see you in Vegas. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Anything, anybody see anything wrong with that video? Yes? That script was not made by AI. I actually wrote the script, gave it to Greg. He did some revisions to it. Um, but he's chewing gum. He's also about this big on the far right-hand side of the screen, left side of the screen. I'm about this big, and I'm on the other side of the screen, right? So Greg said, hey, we should redo this. Matter of fact, this is a session about AI. We should have AI do it. So. Greg said, send me a couple of pictures, and I'm getting ready to go to the beach. I said, all right. Took my phone, went, I put the same shirt on that I did the video. I did click, click. I sent him these two pictures. That's all I sent him. Then this is what he did with it. Let me find it. Hello, everyone. My name is Phil Bautista, IEEE senior member. And today I have enlisted an AI avatar to provide a sneak preview into the Rising Stars keynote session on the symbiotic relationship between AI and human intelligence. Greg Morrison, who by the way will also be represented by an AI avatar in this session preview, is the chief AI officer at White Tip Sharks based in San Diego, California. Greg, not his avatar, will be delivering this keynote session live at the IEEE Rising Stars 2024 conference in Las Vegas. During this session, Greg will share valuable insights for harmonizing AI and human intelligence in the enterprise. Greg has an impressive background in delivering innovative business solutions at scale to the technology market. His innovation portfolio spans both leading technology providers and Fortune 500 companies. He also played a key role in the development of the Information Technology Infrastructure Library Framework, which continues to be the de facto standard for IT best practices worldwide. Greg, what drew you into the world of artificial intelligence? Thanks, Phil. It is truly an honor to be a part of the Rising Stars lineup this year. I'd like to take a little sidebar for our audience today before we dive in. We thought it would be fun to use AI avatars for the session preview in the hopes of triggering that art of the possible thinking when it comes to AI avatar use cases in the enterprise. As we all know, AI is poised to be one of the defining technologies of the 21st century, and it will fundamentally change the way we work. I don't think anyone would argue the point that AI will play an instrumental role in the way we attract, acquire, and serve customers in the future. So you get it, right? One's us, one's not us, but he was able to clean up. He's not chewing gum. He used a selfie also. He actually put the background in for both of us. So that was just a little something fun uh, that I thought I would share with you since Greg is not and here. Your, your voice is completely believable, by the way, in the dub over. <laughs> Absolutely. Ask your parents or YouTube <laughs> Max Hedrum. You guys are too young to know who that is. But go look at that. Go look up those and you'll, you'll laugh even harder when you see that. 
Google it, YouTube. Like 1984 circa. Like, uh. Yeah, not Orwellian, but 1984. <laughs> so why should you listen to us? Why should you listen to Chris and I? Here's a little bit of a background uh, on me and then one on Chris. So I am a senior IEEE member. Does anyone not know what a senior IEEE member means in this audience? Okay, everyone knows what that means. So I am a senior IEEE member. I have a DOD secret clearance. Uh, I also have a Security Plus certification, which is required to do any work on any government computers in my field. Uh, I am also an FBI InfraGuard member for the Austin chapter. I am an emergency services officer for the Travis County Amateur Radio Emergency Services in where, which I live. Uh, areas of expertise that I have are AI, data, security, automation, information, information technology, among others. Some of my DOD clients uh, are the Pentagon, hence the shirt. Uh, U.S. House of Representatives, I handle the 116th Congressional Transition for all 435 members and 110 uh, committees. Uh, I've also worked with the Health and Human Services at the federal level, the United States Air Force. I've done some work with NASA, uh, the U.S. Navy. Some of the private sector clients I have are Dell, Starbucks, 7-Eleven, Lockheed Martin, Baylor College of Medicine, and some others. Uh, the fun facts about me, there are two fun facts about me. One is, uh, I am one of the few people that I know that has been trained and knows how to fly the space shuttle when it was, uh, when it was flying. It's a very, it's, it's a fun experience. Uh, in the simulator, by the way, I've never taken it actually up. So, um, but another, uh, the other fun fact is that um, I developed the world's first microprocessor controlled scuba diving computer. Um, in, in a nine-week course that was led by Mike Andrews 42 years ago. So that's me in a nutshell, and here's Chris. So I'll go through this pretty quickly, but yeah, um, I tell everyone I can give Forrest Gump a run for his money and how random kind of my, my career got me to where I am now. But yes, I started out in the U.S. Army. Um, in support in, in Army Intelligence, which I was an ABC student in high school. I had no academic ambition. It was the first time anybody ever said, hey, you're intelligent. But I thought Army Intelligence, the bar's got to be pretty low. But anyway, Army Intelligence, went to NSA, DHS, DIA, all those agencies. Um, right place at the right time when I was getting out of the Army in 2004, this little agency called the Department of Homeland Security was just starting. And they literally said, Chris, you have a top secret clearance. We've got this thing called critical infrastructure protection and cybersecurity. I go, wow, those are big words, I'll do it. And that's kind of how I got started there. And then uh, I was honored to be the Director of Counterintelligence Operations for DIA's Research and Technology Protection Mission, which is basically making sure that our defense systems and technologies are being sold or dealt with by our contractors to nation state adversaries and things like that. Um, and then I moved back to Texas where I, I was the first director of audits and investigations for regulatory compliance for all the electric utilities. So NERC, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, this is the first time they rolled out a cybersecurity regulatory model that carried a $1 million a day per penalty punitive threshold, which made everyone scared to be compliant but not secure, and I can get into that later briefly. But then I said I'd never be a politician and somehow I ended up politically appointed to the Texas for Texas Utilities to the State Cyber Council and I've co-authored legis legislation. The coolest thing that's most relevant to emergent tech and me kind of priding myself on my technology evangelism is I was asked to be the first sort of CISO and controls model architect for a company called Diligent Robotics in Austin who were a startup at the time but they were going to market with an AI robotic nurse named Moxie and she is now deployed in almost every hospital system across North America now. And I'm kind of the father that kind of put her infant model, controls model in as a baby. And now she's learned from like 300 controls to probably self-learned millions of controls now on her own thanks to AI. I thought but, you said you didn't have any children. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was kind of weird. Yeah. I, it was kind of weird. Never had that interaction with a machine before. But anyway, and then the fun fact that kind of is briefly, the whole thing started, this whole things started as me having a brief former uh, professional soccer career, which is very weird, but I learned how to speak languages and that's what got me in the military and they told me I was smart, so there you go. Great, thank you. Uh, we're gonna go through some definitions uh, real briefly here. 
so I'm not going to dwell on a lot of these. We're going to talk about what artificial intelligence is, what it means, what machine learning is and means, what a large language model means, what hallucinations are in terms of AI, what open loop large language models and closed loop large language models are. I'm not going to read this slide, but basically if you hear, you, you pretty much probably know what AI is. Uh, at White Tip, we actually turn AI on its head and, and we call it intelligent automation because AI is, 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 the term is new, but the concept is not new. So uh, we all know what AI is basically. It's, you know, being able to, to solve uh, human-like problems uh, and adapt. Machine, lear machine learning uh, is up there as all, so it's a subset of artificial intelligence. A large language model is basically no nothing more than a big data set that, that's used to train, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the artificial intelligence models like ChatGPT. A hallucination, as in, who has never heard of what a hallucination is in terms of AI? Okay, so, so what a hallucination is, is when you ask ChatGPT something and it tells you something completely wrong and off the wall, that's a hallucination, okay? It has nothing to do with drugs. Uh, but anyway, so here we are, the hallucination. So these are a couple of terms that I put up here. There are, and this kind of dates back to the old uh, cloud days, right? People say, oh, I'm going to go to the cloud. I'm going to go to the cloud. Well, cloud can be determined. There, there's, there's, you know, you've heard of public clouds, private clouds. The same thing applies in large language models, right, in AI. You can have your open loop L, uh, large language model like ChatGPT where basically anybody can access it and it learns from whatever it gets on the internet. And by the way, if it's wrong, it learns the wrong thing, okay? Uh, a closed loop large language model is something that you control. You can download the API, you can create your own uh, large language model and you can feed it what you want to feed it and you can control who gets access to it. So those are the difference between open and closed loop large language models. We'll have questions at the end, but I want to try to get through some of these slides. Um, the top five advantages of AI is the automation and efficiency with which we get. There's the, the speed uh, of data analysis and the insights we get. There's increased productivity. There's the ability to personalize uh, the, the models. And there's innovations in things like healthcare. So um, these are just some of the lower level definitions here, automation and efficiency. We can automate routine tasks, improve the efficiency. Um, and allow human workers to focus on more complex tasks. The data analysis and insights, you know, again, there's vast amounts of data that we can access, um, which is beneficial to us. In productivity, we all know that computers work faster than we do, and by the way, they can multitask. When a human says they can multitask, it's, that's a misnomer. We can switch tasks, but we can't just, you know, automatically turn and do one thing or another. We actually switch, we don't multitask. Machines can't. Personalization is here, um, so again, we can use their behavior and provide personal, personalized experiences. Uh, healthcare, uh, again, is, is an area that, like Chris just said, talked about with his, with his kid, Moxie. Uh, and there are some threats, right? So AI has some threats that we're, we're, most of us are probably aware of. Uh, people are afraid that, you know, AI is going to take your job. Well, so did the blacksmith when the, when the car came along, right? Uh, you, you learn if you're a blacksmith and, and now there's no more horses, you learn how to make cars. So that's just a natural transition. So if you're in this room and you're not studying AI or you're not focused on trying to find out where AI fits in your career, you should start doing so. Um, there are, you know, there's bias and fairness issues. There are security concerns. And that's something that Chris and I will talk about probably the most, the security concerns. Um, and there's the lack of accountability and transparency. You don't know who's accessing your data. You don't know uh, who's feeding the data because it's coming from every place. Um, and there are also social and ethical implications here. And again, I'm, I'm not going to read each one of these because I want to get down to some of the, the examples and questions and answers that we have. Uh, again, security concerns. If, if it's on the internet, it's, it's typically susceptible to malicious attacks uh, with, with ABT threats. So here are a couple of examples. Uh, how many of you just, how many of you are aware that the New York Times is suing ChatGPT? Okay, it's because they said, hey, you used our data to, to, to train your model. Well, you put the data on the internet, what did you expect, right? So that's one of the security concerns. So, you know, who's at fault? Is it ChatGPT for using publicly available data to train this large language model? You know, Chris writes policy. What are the regulations that protect uh, or, or support, you know, that, right? And I can chime in on that really quickly. Again, 
my whole career the last 20 years has been trying to bridge the chasm that's between regulatory compliance and being secure and efficient and mitigating risk. And those are huge, there's a huge gap and it's always there. The thing with regu they're trying to regulate AI now is they realize they needed to do something, but like by the time it gets to a regulation, it's already too late. You know, um, in electric utilities, for example, we still can't adopt the cloud and be compliant fully because that's how long and bureaucratic it, it, it is to develop and sustain these regulations. Yes, there needs to be some controls and parameters put around it, but AI is the first technology that, you know, I can see is going to be very, very hard to corral now that that genie's out of the bottle. But it doesn't mean we're not gonna try. So that's kind of where we're at right there. You'll see, you'll see more and more, uh, uh, you know, focus on regulation and, and, and sort of uh, broadcasting that uh, as best they can. But um, it's important to remember that AI is new for everybody, so the best practices and all that are kind of being developed now. And the workforce is being developed now. It doesn't exist. So uh, we're kind of all shooting from the hip here, but it's going to be kind of, again, uh, learn as we go. And so the question here that, that, that's, that's begged to be asked is, who's right? Is, should the New York Times prevail? You know, what, what laws are out there? The answer is there aren't any laws yet, right? We have to interpret the old pre-AI laws to try to figure this out. And people actually tried to do that with Google when it came out too. But then when they realized Google is helping them make money too, they withdrew their lawsuits. But we'll get into that later, but Google is essentially one of the first familiar versions of AI that we, we have. Thanks, Chris. Um, okay, is this the next slide? Yeah. So. Uh, this is an example where, I mean, how, how many have used ChatGPT for any of your schoolwork? Okay, what did the teacher say? Do it, don't do it? Raise your hand if the teacher said, go for it. Okay, raise Ra your hand if the teacher said, don't do it. Raise your hand if they knew, either way. Only a couple, uh aha, -huh. that, that's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is a study that was, that was done where the teacher said, I don't care. Chat GPT's out there. I'm not going to be able to stop you. You're supposed to study anyway. Whatever. You can use Chat GPT on the exam. So there were other students that said, oh, cool. I can use Chat GPT. I'm going to have a beer. I'm not going to study. Time came for the test. Ask Chat GPT. Get an answer. Put it in. Guess what? Wrong. Right? But the students that knew that and had tested this said, oh, well, that answer is close. But I'm going to refine my query. And then you get a closer answer. And they may refine the query a little, little more to they finally get an answer that they're comfortable with, which kind of matches their knowledge. But by the time that they were able to refine their query a few times, they got more answers right than the people who just said, hey, chat, GPT, what's the answer? And put it down. There was, a, there was the last group of students who said, I've studied this. I know this. I'm not going to waste time on chat, GPT. It's going to give me the wrong answer. No, I have to do all this refining of my query. I'm going to put down the right answer. Guess what? those students actually scored better on the test. So the conclusion is ChatGPT is useful, but it rarely provides complete or correct answers. How many in this room would agree with that statement? How many disagree? Okay. How many would agree with that statement that currently that's the capability of ChatGPT when you're using it as far as currently? I can see it quickly evolving to where it gets better and better because that's what it does. There's a, there was an example last year, and I'm from Austin, Texas. Uh, UT, one of the professors there, actually busted his entire class using chat GPT and failed them all. I guess my advice to you there would be, make sure you um, like make your queries a little bit more you know, inquisitive or not so basic, because I bet you teachers are writing in you know, their questions as queries and seeing what comes out and seeing how everyone's answer is the same. But that's going to fade away and go, which with, with, at the pace that that's evolving, that's why it's going to get harder and harder to check these things. But the perfect example, again, it baffles me that I'm considered old in this room, but I remember when we didn't have internet, and I remember we had to read books and cite books at the end of our papers and all that stuff, and then Google came along. How are our teachers going to be able to check if we use Google or not? You know, this is just the next evolution of that technology, but definitely on steroids and developing faster than we can keep up with. Absolutely, great point. Um, so in Austin, Texas, we have a lot of um, uh, meetups, right? So I went to uh, one meetup, it's an AI meetup, 
and I'm milling around talking to people, and most of them are trying to get money from somebody. Most of them are sitting there all day, you know, surfing the web on their, it was at a brewery, big surprise, Austin, right? Um, and so I walked in there, and I talked to this guy, and, and I said, so what do you do with AI? He goes, well, I work at, at eBay. And I said, okay. What does that have to do with AI? He goes, we get a lot of people trying to sell Louis Vuitton bags, right? And he goes, I don't know if they're, fa I don't, you know, I don't, we, we can't tell. So they actually downloaded, uh, they used the API and downloaded uh, the kit and created their own large language model and their own um, ability to upload photos of actual uh, legitimate uh, Louis Vuitton bags. And then when someone posts something on eBay, they can compare what the picture that's being posted is compared to what the actual bag is. And their hope, at this time, he hadn't actually perfected this. They were still working on it. He said, our hope is to be able to take our um, library of known good Louis Vuitton bags, authentic bags, and compare them to what people are trying to sell and catch thieves that are trying to, to, to basically defraud us. So in this particular case, no one's ever going to see their data because it's not exposed to the internet. It's only used internally. Right? So the value is that it's not exposed to the internet. Nobody can A, populate it, B, use it, and uh, so, you know, or, or learn how to fool their, their large language model that eBay has spent time and money developing. So now eBay is able to use this large language model and detect these fake bags sold on the website and prevent you from buying a fake for a lot more money than you should. One thing I'll add that you guys, this is really relevant to you guys because you're probably already doing it right now or will be doing it very shortly. I've been in the last year applying for jobs against, for different exec and C-suite stuff and think, my resume is perfect. Why am I getting calls? What the hell's going on? Well, AI is screening your application and screening your package from all those job sites you're, 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 you're applying to and keyword searching and whatever, even though I think I have plenty of keywords that meet every requirement of that job description. A hack that I've noticed is I'll add a blank page in white script that's the job description and cut and paste it into my application. And believe it or not, I've been getting a lot more calls the last three months. But there's an example of people relying on AI and they're missing out on talent or you're being frustrated because you're not getting calls for things you think you obviously are qualified to do. So I'd encourage you to uh, be mindful of that as you start applying for jobs. Have you ever taken your resume and, and used a white font in a back background and sent it up to see if they can do a, a character search? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and here's another good baseline test for you guys to do every couple of years. Remember how I'm sure you guys have Googled yourselves at times, haven't you? Why don't you right now ask ChatGPT to write a bio on you and see what it does. See how right it is and then as, do that every couple years and see how it learns as you've posted more stuff or your career has gotten off further and things like that. Th those are very, that's a very eye-opening exercise. I don't think I have a slide for this, but I'm going to talk to it if I, if I, if I can. Um, not student, not closed loop. Um, okay, so th I don't have a slide on this because they can be put this deck together kind of at the last minute, but I will tell you that there was a, in, there was a news article on broadcast television where a grandfather got a phone call and it was the voice of his grandson and he said grandpa grandpa please help me send some money and the grandpa's like oh my my kid needs money my grand grandson needs money and sent the money thousands and thousands of dollars but he had no way to authenticate it so i will tell you this being in security just like chris and having children your, your children doesn't your, your kid doesn't need this moxie doesn't yeah, need this know. But um, so both of my children have key passphrases that I can authenticate them. So if I get a call, and, and I, by the way, sometimes my kid loses their phone. They said, hey, Dad, I'm calling from so-and-so's boat over here. My phone fell in the water. I'm like, yeah? What's your keyword? And, and by the way, the, the keywords that they have can also be represented with icons. So if it's either an icon or a keyword, I can authenticate them. And I know I'm not going to send money. And, and so th I, if, if, you, if you're trying to authenticate, I, I, would, I would highly, for those of you that have children or will have children or want to authenticate, it's, it's a great way to authenticate whether or not this is an actual um, uh, conversation or a video or whether it's AI. I never thought the day would come that you know, people would have to use the same military level encryption techniques that I used in the army to talk to their kids on, you know, to make sure they're authenticating to even friends and family, you know, but that's where we're going. But then 
The other thing that's kind of, it's getting better is I've become known as kind of the Mr. Rogers PSA guy in Austin where the local news media calls me in to explain things without, even in my head, I'm like, you moron, don't leave the default password there. Don't make it ABCD1234. When I, when I uh, explain those things, I'm very nice and nurturing and kind of say, hey, guys, this is the way of the world. You have to get on board what we call cyber hygiene, and that's the next level of it. If you can't manage changing your passwords or password complexity or multi, uh, uh, multi-factor authentication, you better start doing it now because this kind of stuff is going to be a part of life uh, f- going forward. So um, definitely want to offer that in. And then more relevant to this audience, the kids. I'm sure they heard all, or they heard, they didn't see. How many people heard the Drake track that came out that was AI generated? Did you all, anybody hear about that? Nobody music lovers in here? Phil and I, that's how we met. We're musicians as well. And I found it very, very fascinating when I heard that track. And even Drake was like, man, they, it sounds better than me. You know, but to show you the application of AI to uh, smoke and mirrors, uh, the things you love and who you are, um, that's a pretty, a pretty scary and kind of crazy uh, uh, use and outcome for it. Chris does a very good job of being politically correct. He doesn't make people feel stupid when he's on TV going, I would probably change the default password. My test audience is my wife and my, my mom when I present, and if they understand what I'm saying, then I'm good. So um, you saw in my bio that I'm one of the few people that has uh, been trained to fly the space shuttle. Uh, one of the interesting things about the space shuttle, and I had a conversation with Mike Andrews about that, and Mike says, yeah, AI, whatever, you know, we've been doing predictive, uh, you know, modeling and things, uh, predictive data modeling and things for years. We, we now call it AI, we now, you know, use it in different ways, but the, the NASA space shuttle uh, on the flight deck, there are actually five computers, and they're probably about as powerful as an, as an IBM 386, right? But there are five computers. Four of them make decisions on the flight control surface, and one of them is, is a supervisor. So if one of the, if one of the four flight control uh, computers makes a decision that is incongruent with the other three, it's out from the decision-making process because it's made a mistake, it's hallucinated, until it makes a series of decisions that are in line with or congruent with the other three uh, flight control computers, and the supervisory computer monitors all that and puts it in or out of the decision-making path. Is that AI? Well, you know, it's, it's using data and it's using, um, you know, an algorithm to basically be able to learn how to basically fly the space shuttle, which, by the way, most of our most of our uh, shuttle pilots in Houston were all Navy pilots. And no offense to Navy pilots here, but try to tell a Navy pilot when he's sitting on a rocket that he doesn't need to touch the stick. Truth be told, the space shuttle is completely capable of taking off, doing its SRB rotation, and and coming back and and, and landing. Uh, to earth, the only thing it won't do is put the gear handle down. And that's a safety factor, right? You don't want the shuttle landing gear up, right? So the only thing that you actually need a pilot in the space shuttle for, or was, is to put the gear down. It'll do everything else all by itself. Um, So, And what I can offer there from an engineering perspective, if you were in my session yesterday, we talked about SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. That's the same protocol he's talking about with the computers and the space shuttle. Um, as the regulator for electric utilities, I fell into industrial control systems and, aud- and, and auditing SCADA. That is yet another example of how we've had that capability for a long time, but it wasn't full out called artificial intelligence. It wasn't the sexy term we have today. Um, and the other thing, I'm sure you've heard this, but having worked in the industry with DOD and everything else, you've, you've heard that there's more uh, computing power in your iPhone than what it took to land the first man on the moon. That's 150% fact. So, I mean, that's mind-blowing when you think about it. But also, our capabilities we've had for 20 years or so wasn't necessarily called AI, but things learn on their own. And we've kind of been developing that and nurturing that for a very, very long time with people we just, we didn't really know it or put two and two together. Thanks, Chris. So, I've got one more example um, here. So, the the... Again, one of my other fun facts is I I led the team, so I didn't do all the work. I led the team, probably the most exciting thing I've ever done, led the team uh, in in 1980 to develop the world's first microprocessor-controlled scuba diving computer. Now, uh, I say computer, it was an an uh, 
It, it was HD 6811. It was 8-bit microprocessor with a little bit. It was an onboard clock. We used UV EEPROMs for it, okay? But we used... i got to stop you. To those kids, that's like we rubbed, smashed two rocks together and created fire. It, it, you understand? It, I mean, it, I have no... It, that's it, exactly. EEPROM, UV EEPROM, right? Um, but so, so we used the U.S. Navy dive tables as our large language model, which was devised over years to be able to identify how deep humans can go, how long they can stay, and how long it should take them before they res resume their next dive within 24 hours. So this was all data that we used to program. And, and by the way, the diving computer would, at a, at a one hertz frequency, one, one time per second, it would evaluate your dive. Because when you go diving, how many, any divers in here? Okay. So, so thank you. So for those of you that don't know, if you're going to go scuba diving, you've got to plan how deep you're going to go. You've got to look up in the chart. If I'm going to go to this depth, how long can I stay before I enter a decompression dive and the nitrogen in my body becomes liquid and has to be reabsorbed before I can come back to the surface? And if I do that, how long do I stop and where do I stop? And then you've got to add that residual nitrogen factor into your next dive within, if you dive within 24 hours. That's a lot of work. What if you're diving and you're at 100 feet and you've been there for like five minutes, which is about the threshold to enter a decompression dive, and you drop your knife? Now you're at 110 feet. Now you got to recalculate. Did you bring your calculator? No. You pull up a bunch of uh, 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 plastic uh, cards and you figure it out why you're at 110 feet. Okay. So what we did is basically used artificial intelligence to monitor this and give you signals letting you know five minutes before a decomp dive, one minute before a decomp dive, and then monitor your ascent rate to see if you're going too fast, if you're going to get the bends, and then again, monitor your residual, residual nitrogen time. So again, this was 1980, 1980. So um, I don't think I have a whole lot more examples. We've got like eight to seven minutes here, uh, but you got a question before we, we go? Okay, so the next slide may be a little bit of a shocker, but I think some of you saw it when I went through it. This deck was mostly created with AI. I went to ChatGPT and said, I know what I need to talk about, but I don't want to write it. So I said, tell me the five, tell me the five uh, benefits of AI, tell me the five threats of AI, and I, I copied and pasted that on here, you, knowing that I could figure out what it is and, and, and decide whether or not I wanted to put it into the deck. The rest of the deck is stuff that, um, that and by the way, as, uh, as you know, the video that was created uh, was created by, by Greg. So um, anybody surprised by this? And then Pardon? Yeah, 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 exactly. consider, yeah it, we just showed you it works. But um, I think the other thing, you know, the other thing to consider is AI sounds like gee whiz fancy, like, you know, cool next thing, which it is. But at its core, it's just a set of baseline rules, right? When I wrote the, the architecture for that uh, robotic nurse, Moxie, I wrote like 300 controls, best practice, security controls, data privacy controls, because I audited those. I'm not an engineer, folks, but I know what the baseline foundation of rules something like this should operate in from industry best practices and things I've learned over my career. I'm not an engineer. I, you know... I, 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 again, I, I'm in a room when people say cybersecurity expert, Chris Summers is like, they're talking about me. But like, uh, getting the foundation and process and controls in place first is critical to anything you do engineering wise. When I go to a client, the engineers hate me when I show up because they're like, I've been screaming for this stuff for three years and you bring this consultant in to do it? By the end of the time, he's my best friend because I taught him how to template controls and processes and follow a controls model. That's 80% of all this stuff. Keep it simple, stupid, but it's very easy to build a baseline AI model and see where it goes. Moxie now knows millions of processes based on the infant model that I gave her when she started, and that model gives her her authority to operate in hospital systems. So for diligent robotics, if they don't get their ATO, there's no Moxie. Well, that mo my model still holds up now, tried and true, and she's all over the North America now. It's kind of cool to see that. But I'm, again, I would never think that I would have the, techno or, you know, the smarts to start building AI models, but it's very easy. I want to tell you guys, like, it's not that hard. If I can do it, anyone can.
and ATO, the authority to operate for all the um, acronym folks out there. So we've only got a few minutes, but um, and I'd, I'd like to invite anyone, if you want to come up and, and ask questions, we've got a couple of microphones. Feel free to stand in line if, you, if there's more than one of you. So I'll go ahead and ask that now. But, but as I do, as, go ahead, come on up. As you're coming up, I will tell you that I, I am in the IT service management business. You know, I consult with the Pentagon on how to, how to do process, how to manage data, how to manage assets. And um, one of the things that you, when you like call, you, you'll get the, the chat bot. The way that those large language models are trained is it asks you for information and then you give it information and then behind the scenes people are saying, yeah, that's right, no, that's wrong. And that's how those are developed. That's how they we're able to solve problems a lot faster. Yes, please, uh, tell us your name and, and what's your question. Yeah, so my name is Esteban Gomez and my question here is when it comes to artificial intelligence, uh, especially like chat GPT, how close are we to acknowledging that such type of AIs are now going to be, like I said, acknowledged to pass the Turing test? Because I also seen some speculations that when Google was working with Lambda, some engineers were saying like, we had to shut down Lambda because it became too good for us and it potentially passed the Turing test. and. I want to know when are we going to like know if an AI has passed a Turing test and how is society going to react to this? I, I can offer a little, again, high level example of that. Um, the answer, short answer is, depends on how quickly and how much all of us are starting to use AI because it's, it's self-learning on dependent upon its user base and what, what it's applied to. It's just like Google. Google continue to advance its search capability based on the queries its end users put in. I think that is the same translatable measure, but on steroids until you see an AI capability uh, passing a Turing, you know, an Alan Turing test or something like that. I think, I think it'll happen much quicker. I think, I don't think we've figured out what we're gonna say or do when that happens or what that means, but uh, we're definitely, I, I think, the powers that be are definitely trying to keep an eye on that as the measure of the oh crap moment, you know, as we see it going there. And there are challenges. I mean, didn't they pull all the self-driving cars out of Austin? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Tesla's now in Austin, uh, and, and they're in everything. It's pretty cool. Um, the the self-driving stuff is, you know, you see on the news every day, you know, how somebody else died because of the, 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 the self-driving thing didn't work. Um, but we have a new company in Austin, several of them, one is Torque Robotics, who is an AI um, uh, self-driving 18-wheeler company. And those trucks are already on the road right now. But there's a human in there as a safety measure. But by next end of next year, they want to be completely humanless in their cabs. And if you want, go look up 60 Minutes on the pieces they did on the AI trucking industry and how the, the trucking industry... It, it, there's not, it, it's going to be replaced like coal mining and stuff like that within the next 10 years. But you see the systems on these 18-wheelers and the cameras and the sensors and what it can see and what it can learn. I mean, it's the most advanced thing I've ever seen. It, it puts a, a Tesla to, you know, to shame. But that's where we're headed. So it's adapt or die type kind of a thing, I think, with that. Uh, we, we'll probably have time for one more question. you have a question? Yeah. Come on up. Tell us your name and what's your question. Uh, my name's Jay. So coming from a military intelligence background in the Army, uh, one of my concerns with something like ChatGPT, we've already seen a problem with it in news where a lot of times they'll just use ChatGPT to just generate articles on top of just resulting in a misinformation apocalypse on the civilian side. This could also potentially cause a lot of harm when it's being used to pretend to be a government official or even someone in the intelligence network and start relaying false reports and misleading policy and even sometimes even getting assets or agents or even soldiers killed. Yeah. So what are, what are some ways that you guys are looking into as far as trying to prevent something like that? Well, being a, thank you for your service. We're probably brothers in arms as well, just a few years off. Um, th I put this in perspective. In the first Gulf War in 1990, we were still dropping leaflets and propaganda from planes. Now, we're doing very targeted social media campaigns that are the most convincing thing and, and psychologically developed to attract that 1% of 1% of 1% to do what we want them to do without them knowing they're doing it for us. That's how sophisticated this stuff has gotten. And make no mistake, 
Nation states have gotten really good at that. We're not always on the defense. I'll just say that, allegedly. We're not just a defender. We're, we're, we kind of, we have our share of offending and developing these things as well. Um, and it's going to have to be something that, again, command and control and those kinds of things that we talk about in the military are now transitioning over to the private sector where I told people yesterday about sit reps and how to validate, you know, it's, again, it, it baffles me that this military terminology is now part of everyday life, but you guys probably you know, don't necessarily know that directly. Um, I think that's going to be a continual problem. I think the most relevant example of that in the private sector is everybody remembers Pizzagate. You all remember that one where the guy thought this guy was pizza restaurant was this guy was molesting kids in the basement and showed up armed to the teeth, to, and it was all fake. We're going to see more and more and more of that now, and to the credit of social media, people like, you know, uh, Meta and folks like that, they are doing some great work now to catch that stuff. Before it was like, you know, whatever, we'll say we're doing it, but, you know, we don't care. It's, you know, we're not going to pay that. But now they're doing that very, very well in catching this stuff. And it, it's got to continue to evolve for our own protection. Okay, we may be out of time, Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, Scott's. Come on up, come on up. We'll wait for Scott to come up and kick us off the stage. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Play, music will play us off from Drake. AI generated will play <laughs> us off when we need to wrap it up. Hi. What is your name? Uh, my name's Rocio Lopez, and my question's regarding closed loop and open loop networks. And is there a direct correlation with less hallucinations in a closed loop system as opposed to an open loop system? So it would depend on how it was populated. But it would, it, would, it would reason that a closed loop system that has less false information would give you less hallucinations, right? But again, it's up to you. If you feed it bad information, it could certainly hallucinate. So it's, it's, it's possible to say that a closed loop uh, large language model won't give you any er erroneous information or hallucinate, but it's less likely because it's populated more, and, and there's more focus on getting it the right information. Because you don't want it to hallucinate, right? You want it to be correct. So, uh, but if you give it information that's incorrect and you don't know it, then, then it may very well hallucinate, probably with less frequency than an open loop model that's out uh, on the internet, or people can, people actually intentionally feed, right, like fake news, they will intentionally feed a large language model with some data so that it will give you the wrong information or hallucinate. Does it answer your question? From a, from a hallucinogenic perspective, think of the data as the psychedelic. I'll translate it to, I, I don't want to say that, you know, I'm not endorsing drug use, but I'm making, making the <laughs> translation of, the data itself is the quality of psychedelic you're using that'll have that hallucination, and it'll either be a good trip or a bad trip, depending on what you're doing. So the data is the mushroom. What's that? The data is the mushroom. The data is the psilocybin or whatever else you want to call it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? And yeah, just because I'm from Austin, don't think like I, I, I'm an expert on that. I'm not, but I'm trying to relate to you kids, not saying that you guys are all, you know, whatever. <laughs> We're, we're purple in Austin. We're not red or blue. We have a question over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, just my name's Austin, by the way. I just am really interested in how you're talking about open loop, closed loop, large language models. How do you kind of see potentially AI becoming more personal and say, you know, how far off do we maybe have our own Jarvis and something like that? I, I think there's a very cool, there was a series on Netflix about, like, the future of certain technologies. And one episode they had was on the, uh, funeral home and cremation industry. And what was very cool on that is, you know, and some of the national news coverage have covered it where, you know, they have this tool now where you read like a couple paragraphs and it downloads your voice. And what, they're, what, this, what this piece on Netflix was, was talking about is this is uh, what Neuralink could probably do, what, what Elon Musk is envisioning is you can now download your conscience after you die and your Siri or your, 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 um, What's the Amazon one? Siri and Alexa is now your, you know, dead grandmother from, you know, that died 30 years ago talking to you. That like was, she would talk to you, you know, when, you're, when she was alive. That was Upload, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Great absolutely. series. So, yes, I, I, I think that's an example of, that's about the most personal example I can think of. But I think there are going to be offshoots and variants from that to where we can, we can adapt that to our own personal lives in the, in the best way we see fit. Okay, but wait a minute. Yesterday, you told, you, you, in this other session, you were talking about the fact that kids talk about something and then their phone shows them some ads. Is, uh, is that what he's talking about? No, 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 no. This is like, 
the old folks in the room that, you know, for a long time it was like, man, my phone's listening to me. I was just talking about this stuff yesterday, and it shows up in my feed the next day. They're shocked by that, but they don't know that by default their microphone's enabled on their cell phone, and the app makes it that way. They don't know to check those things. And then after they realize, they understand how it's happening, they embrace it. I think it's cool. I, I don't watch ads anymore or commercials, do any of you, unless they're really funny and clever. But I think it's great that we see that kind of suggestion when it's listening to me. You know, now if it starts sending me things like, I don't know, there's a fine line. But, but I, I think that's a great, uh, that, that's an ex we've, we've now gone from freaked out to accepting and embracing that capability. Well, in addition to that, your browsing history also is populating what it's feeding you, right? So you're on Facebook and you see something, you see a reel, you click on the reel, next thing you've got a whole bunch of reels just like that. My girlfriend gets, my girlfriend gets little kitty videos. She goes, what do you got all these boat videos for? I'm like, well, because I like the boat reels, you know, or I like the boat ads, or I like the Facebook marketing group that has boats, and, you know. So anyway, so it's a combination of, you know, what you and, hear. And, 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 th and that's a generational, like, migration. I think your generation grew up in this era. Like, your data being out there, you accept that, and you, you, you know what can be done, and you like to see where it goes. Yes, there are people that can, that can compromise that and use that nefariously, but you guys seem to be totally okay with what you post and what you don't, some of you. Our generation was still like, this is all crazy to me. Like, I don't want to, you know, I'm careful what I post. And I don't want my data being used. Now, what we did in Texas was GDPR light for Texas, but what GDPR says, and that's why you have all the cookie warnings on websites when you come, go to it, but what GDPR says is, if I'm a consumer using a service and they're using my data, I get their permission, I have to give them their permission to use it, give their permission to retain it or not when I'm gone, and I should be getting money back from the data they're using. So that's where that's going to evolve to kind of control that. But th th I wanted to provide that, that kind of context as well. Thank you, Chris. Do we have any other questions? We're a little bit over. No other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for, for attending this presentation. Thank you.